Good morning. Today I'm going to read a quick sermon that I wrote this morning uh, entitled The Absurdity of the Tithe, a practical teaching on why the modern practice of tithing is unbiblical and is actually robbing widows and orphans by Duane Lynn. I wish to take a moment on this day, February 8th, 2015, and address the false and wicked practice known as the tithe. The modern method of tithing is practiced in virtually every denomination of Christianity. Baptists, Word of Faith, Presbyterians, you name it. They all make their congregations pay 10% of their earnings to finance the business of Christianity. The ministers of greed will teach these verses to try and justify tithing in the modern day church. I will first use the words taught in the churches in bold and then follow with the true teaching in bold italics. Also, make a note that this uh, sermon will also is available in uh, PDF format or also Word format. Just uh, shoot me an email and uh, I can get that to you. Anyway, continuing with the sermon. The first source that most teachers will use uh, comes from Genesis chapter 14, verse 20. The preacher will begin the money sermon by telling you that Abraham tithed before the law. Here's the verse used to try and bait the proverbial tithing hook. Genesis 14, verse 20. And blessed be the Most High, which hath delivered thine enemies into thy hand, and he gave him tithes of all. The money preachers use this verse out of context all the time. I will quote some other passages that precede verse 20. Genesis 13, verses 1 and 2. And Abram went out of Egypt, he and his wife, and all that he had, and lot with him, into the south. And Abram was very rich in cattle, silver, and gold. We see here in verses 1 and 2 that Abraham was already rich. He didn't need to be tithed to by his people that uh, were with him. Um, God had already blessed him without institution of the tithe. Genesis 13, verses 14 through 18. And the Lord said unto Abram, after that Lot was separated from him, Lift up now thine eyes, and look from the place where thou art northward, and southward, and eastward, and westward. For all the land which thou seest, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed forever. And I will make thy seed as the dust of the earth, so that if a man can number the dust of the earth, then shall thy seed also be numbered. Arise, walk through the land in the length of it and in the breadth of it, for I will give it unto thee. Then Abram removed his tent, and came and dwelt in the plain of Mamre, which is in Hebron, and there built an altar unto the Lord. Notice here in chapter 13 that there is no mention or command from the Lord to Abram about doling out 10% of everything that he owned. There is no mention of cutting a weekly tithe check to put into the storehouse. We also see that where this meeting took place, isn't exactly where Abraham dwelled. Matter of fact, here is where the meeting between Abram and Melchizedek took place. In Genesis 14, starting in verse 17. And the king of Sodom went out to meet him after his return from the slaughter of Kedarlamer, and of the kings that were with him at the valley of Shaveh, which is the king's dale. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, and he was the priest of the Most High God. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be the Most High God, which hath delivered thine enemies into thy hand. And he gave him tithes of all. That ends in verse 20. If we go back to chapter 14, verse 13, we see where Abram dwells. And there came one that had escaped and told Abram the Hebrew, for he dwelt in the plain of Mamre the Amorite, brother of Ashkal, brother of Aner, and these were confederate with Abram. Abram was not at home when he met with Melchizedek. Therefore, it is deceit to elude that tithes that Abram gave to Melchizedek was from his own property and finances. It did not happen on a weekly basis. Now we see what transpires after Abram gives 10% to Melchizedek. Genesis 14, verse 21. And the king of Sodom said unto Abram, Give me the persons, and take the goods to thyself. And Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have lifted up my hand unto the Lord, the Most High God, the possessor of heaven and earth, that I will not take from a thread, even to a shoe latchet, 
and that I will not take anything that is yours, lest you should say that I have made Abraham rich, except, or save, only that which the young men have eaten, and the portion of the men which went with me, Aner, Eshkol, Mamre, let them take their portion. Again, there's no mention or command given to Abram to a tithe 10% every week, nor is there mention that Abram ever gave 10% again to anyone. I'll give attention to the storehouse later in the sermon. The second source of the false teaching on tithing comes from Genesis 28, in the moments just after Jacob's ladder took place. And the text reads as follows, Genesis chapter 28, verses 10 through 12. And Jacob went out from Beersheba, and went toward Haran. And he lighted upon a certain place, and tarried there all night, because the sun was set. And he took of the stones of that place, and put them for his pillows, and lay down in that place to sleep. And he dreamed. And behold, a ladder set up on the earth, and the top of it reached to heaven. And behold, the angels of God ascending and descending on it. We see here that Jacob is in the midst of his dream. Now, we see the next part as it occurs in Scripture, verses 13 through 15. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham thy father and the God of Isaac. The land whereon thou liest, to thee will I give it and to thy seed. And thy seed shall be as the dust of the earth, and thou shalt spread abroad to the west, and to the east, and to the north, and to the south. And in thee and in thy seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. And behold, I am with thee, and will keep thee in all places wherever you go, and will bring you again into this land, for I will not leave you until I have done that which I have spoken to you of. Now, we come to the part where the money preacher gives his or her, God forbid, second source of tithing. Here is the scripture, Genesis 28, verses 16 through 22, and I read, And Jacob woke up out of his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I knew it not. And he was afraid and said, How dreadful is this place! This is none other but the house of God, and that this is the gate of heaven. And Jacob rose up early in the morning and took the stone that he had put for his pillows and set it up for a pillar and poured oil upon the top of it. And he called the name of that place Bethel. For the name of that city was called Luz at the first. And Jacob vowed a vow, saying, now pay attention to this because this is where the false preacher goes for his source. If God will be with me and will keep me in this way that I go and will give me bread to eat, and raiment or clothing to put on, so that I may come again to my father's house in peace, then shall the Lord be my God. And the stone, which I have set for a pillar, shall be God's house. And of all that thou shalt give me, I will surely give a tenth unto thee. We see here in verses 13 through 15 that the Lord has already proclaimed that he is with Jacob. Nothing was done preceding this statement from the Lord. There was no commandment to tithe. But as we get to the underlying portion of the text in verse 20, we see that Jacob makes a vow based on conditions. If God will be with me, etc. God has already promised Jacob's portion. It was Jacob who said that he would give a tenth if the Lord did all that he said. Hardly what I would call a command to tithe, but the money preachers do use it. And clearly, one can see in the context that there is no command to tithe on a weekly basis, or to tithe 10% of all you own, or purchase in the future, examples given property, boats, cars, etc. No command to threat or disinherit should one not pay tithes, but I do digress. Coming to source number three, when the money preacher is the tithe hook baited with the whole Abraham tithe before the law, and so did Jacob worm, then he, or she, then goes to embed the lie with some verses taken from the letter of the prophet Malachi. I will read in context the content of Malachi and to whom it was directed. Malachi, verse 1, starting in verse 1. The burden of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi. I have loved you, said the Lord, yet you say, how have you loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother? Said the Lord, yet I love Jacob. 
and I hated Esau, and laid his mountains and his heritage waste for the dragons of the wilderness. Whereas Edom said, We are impoverished, but we will return and build the desolate places. Thus says the Lord of hosts, They shall build, but I will throw down. And they shall call them the border of wickedness, and the people against whom the Lord has indignation forever. And your eyes shall see, and you shall say, The Lord will be magnified from the border of Israel. A son honors his father, and a servant his master. If I then be a father, where is my honor? And if I be a master, where is my fear? Said the Lord of hosts, Unto you, O priests, that despise my name. And you say, Wherein have we despised your name? I'll stop for a moment here. We see here in verse 6 that Malachi is speaking directly to the Levitical priesthood. He's not talking to the people of Israel, per se, as in the sense of a congregation, but to the leaders of the congregation, the Pharisees, the Levitical priesthood. But again, I digress. I'll continue in verse 7. You offer polluted bread upon my altar, and you say, wherein have we polluted you? In that you say, the table of the Lord is contemptible. And if you offer the blind for sacrifice, is it not evil? And if you offer the lame and the sick, is it not evil? Offer it now unto your governor. Will he be pleased with you or accept your person, saith the Lord of hosts? And I'll stop again right there. We see here in Malachi chapter 1, verses 7 and 8, the same thing that the Lord Jesus was saying to the Pharisees in Matthew 23 about tithing of mints and anath and cumin, which I will get to later. But these two are the verses that I'm referring to when the Lord Jesus says that this you should have done and the other you should not have left undone. That being left undone is that what was said here in Malachi chapter 1, verses 7 and 8. But again, I will get into that later. Verse 9. And now I pray you beseech God that he will be gracious unto us. This has been by your means. Will he regard your persons, say the Lord of hosts? Who is there even among you that would shut the doors for nothing? Neither do you kindle fire on my altar for nothing. I have no pleasure in you, said the Lord of hosts. Neither will I accept an offering at your hand. Again, this is being directed at the priests. I continue. Verse 11. For from the rising of the sun, even unto the going down of the same, my name shall be great among the Gentiles, and in every place incense shall be offered unto my name, and a pure offering, for my name shall be great among the heathen, saith the Lord of hosts. But you have profaned it, in that you say the table of the Lord is polluted, and the fruit thereof, even his meat, is contemptible. You said also, Behold, What a weariness is it that you have snuffed at it, said the Lord of hosts. And you brought that which was torn, and the lame, and the sick. Thus you brought an offering. Should I accept this of your hand, saith the Lord? Verse 14. But cursed be the deceiver, which has a flock in his his flock a male, and vows and sacrifices unto the Lord a corrupt thing. For I am a great king said the Lord of hosts, and my name is dreadful among the heathen. Here we see a scathing rebuke from the Lord to the priests of Israel. Yes, the priests. The duties of the sacrifice according to the law was done in the temple by the priests. The Levitical and later on Cohen priesthood. Now we're nowhere here in this first chapter do we see anger from the Lord towards the actual people or any command to the people saying that you're going to tithe 10% of your income. Okay? In chapter 2, we're going to see again another round or series of rebukes toward the priesthood. Malachi chapter 2, verse 1. And now, O you priests, this commandment is for you. Verse 2. If you will not hear, if you will not lay it to heart to give glory unto my name, said the Lord of hosts. I will even send a curse upon you, and I will curse your blessings. Yes, I have cursed them already, because you do not lay it to heart. He's not talking to the people, ladies and gentlemen. He's talking to the priests. Verse 3. Behold, I will corrupt your seed and spread dung upon your faces, even the dung of your solemn feasts, and one shall take you away with it. 
and you shall know that I have sent this commandment unto you, that my covenant might be with Levi, said the Lord of hosts. My covenant was with him of life and peace, and I gave them to him for the fear wherewith he feared me, and was afraid before my name. The law of truth was in his mouth, and iniquity was not found in his lips. He walked with me in peace and equity, and did turn many away from iniquity. For the priest's lips should keep knowledge, and they should seek the law at his mouth. For he is the messenger of the Lord of hosts. But you are departed out of the way. You have caused many to stumble at the law, again, towards the priests. You have corrupted the covenant of Levi, said the Lord of hosts. He's actually speaking towards the Kohenites now. And I believe um, in 1 Samuel or 1 Kings, we get a, an idea. I think it's 1 Samuel, maybe 1 Kings, I don't know. But again, that's another story, I digress. It's another sermon, actually. Um, I continue in verse 9. Therefore have I also made you contemptible and base before all the people, according as you have not kept my ways, but have been partial in the law. And again, those verses 1 through 9 in Malachi chapter 2, again, lend weight to what the Lord Jesus was saying to the Pharisees in the temple in Mal and, um, sorry, Matthew chapter 23, when he said that you should have done one and left not the other undone. This is what the Lord Jesus was talking about, is what the prophet Malachi had said to the priesthood. And now, um, I'll continue in verse 10. Have we not all one Father? Hath not one God created us? Why do we deal treacherously every man against his brother by profaning the covenant of our fathers? Judah has dealt treacherously. And an abomination is committed in Israel and in Jerusalem. For Judah has profaned the holiness of the Lord, which he loved, and has married the daughter of a strange god. The Lord will cut off the man that does this, the master and the scholar, out of the tabernacles of Jacob, and him that offers an offering unto the Lord of hosts. And have you done again, covering the altar of the Lord with tears, with weeping, and with crying out, insomuch that he regards not the offering any more, nor receives it with good will at your hand? Yet you say, why? Well, because the Lord has been witness with you and with the wife of your youth, against whom you have dealt treacherously, and yet she is your companion and the wife of your covenant. And in verse 15, And did not he make one? Yet he had the residue of the Spirit. And why one? Well, that he might seek a godly seed. Therefore take heed to your spirit, and let none deal treacherously against the wife of his youth. I think that refers to actual marriage outside of one wife, but uh, you know, again, that's another sermon. Um, but the, I'm, I'm, what I'm actually reading here from verse 10, and I was actually going to continue down through verse 17, but uh, you know, 10 through 17 isn't exactly you know addressing the violations of the duties of the priests, per se. Um, and again, verses 10 through 17 are directed in a general manner toward the actions allowed by the priesthood, i.e. marriages and stuff. Verses 1 through 9 are obviously directed at the priesthood themselves and their services. Okay. Now we come to chapter 3. In chapter 3, we see the prophecy of the coming of John the Baptist as a refining fire toward the wicked practices, wicked practices excuse me, of the priesthood. It serves as a cutting board for the vile wolf in the pulpit who would seek to devour his flock. The money preacher here begins to cut and paste the text to buffer his or her false tithing scheme, to pad it, if you will. Notice here first, though, that the direction of the letter has not changed toward the people, but rather continues toward the wicked, pharisaical priesthood. There's no break in the letter. Okay, It's, it's one continuous rebuke aimed at the wicked practices of these horrid and unfaithful priests. Okay, now to the text. Malachi 3, verse 1. Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me, and the Lord whom you seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant whom you delight in. Behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. But who may abide in the day of his coming, and who shall stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire, and like a fuller's soap. And he, is, and he shall sit as a refiner and a purifier of silver. And he shall purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver, that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. See, he's talking to the priests. He's not talking to the people. He's still, Malachi is still going on towards the priests. 
I know I'm sitting here and hammering this, but I want you to understand, people, that Malachi is a letter of rebuke, scathing rebuke that is directed at the priesthood. Stop listening to the money preachers when they use these verses out of context. And I've got here verses 4 through 7. Um, I'll actually start in verse 7. Um, Even from the days of your fathers you are gone away from my ordinances and have not kept them. Return unto me and I will return unto you, says the Lord of hosts. But you said, why shall we return? Will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. But you say, where did we rob you? In tithes and offerings. Again, they, the, the, the false money preachers try to direct this to the congregation. But in truth, it's actually the priests who are doing the offerings. We saw earlier on in the sermon where they were, they were sacrificing the lame and the blind and the sick. These were not the sacrifices that the Lord demanded, but were supposed to be of the firstling of the fruits of Israel. Again, we'll continue in verse 9. You are cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me, even this whole nation. You're not talking again about the people. He's talking about the priesthood, robbing the people of Israel. Verse 10. Bring you all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in my house. And prove now herewith, said the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there shall be not room enough to receive it. Again, this is towards priests. This is not pay 10% of your income, of your possessions, and God will bless you. This is not God cannot accomplish his will unless you pay your tithes. This is not you are not going to receive any help from the church unless you pay tithes. Nowhere is any of this being said. But yet the false, wicked money preacher is going to insist that this is you the Lord is talking to when it's not true. I'll continue in verse 11. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes, and he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground, neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time in the field, saith the Lord of hosts. And again, here taken out of context, the money preacher has successfully caught the weak-minded congregation on the hook. When you read it in its context, as I've just done for you, you can easily see that there's no rebuke to the people in this context of the modern day, the congregation. There, there's nothing there. Okay, There's no alluding to the modern day church. None whatsoever. But these greedy wolves are going to tell you these things because most of you don't even bother to read your Bibles in their context. You're too worried about other things. But again, I digress. That's a, that's a whole other sermon. Okay, and then if you read the text, you'll see that I finished, you know, putting out uh, verse uh, Malachi 3, verses 12 uh, through 18. Okay, now that we can see Malachi in the context that it was intended, it's not the congregation that's being rebuked and threatened, but the priesthood, the ministers of the law, the modern pastor. Take note of these Old Testament passages used in the money scheme by the modern-day preacher and compare them to the actual law of the tithe. Our little exposition of Malachi is now completed, and we move on now towards the actual law of the tithe. Now, I don't know if any of you out there who are listening or even reading um, have a software by Brendan Skaggs, uh, Staggs, I'm sorry, the Sword Searcher software, I actually use that software it's when I uh, put together sermons, and it's actually really valuable. Um, I would recommend it to anyone. Um, I'm not being paid for endorsing Brandon Staggs. I'm just saying that that's the software that I use. Um, I don't get any endorsement deals or anything like that. The Lord provides for me alone. I don't take any money from anyone, and I never will. Um, anyway, I'll continue. There are 13 verses where the word tithe is used. In the entire King James Version. Not that I'm a King James onlyist, but this is the version that I actually use to do my sermon. And I'll read uh, the actual verses are as follows, and then I'll actually read the verses. Leviticus 27, 30, and 32, Numbers 18, 26, Deuteronomy 12, verse 17, Deuteronomy 14, verses 22 through 23 and 28, Second Chronicles 31, 5, and 6, Nehemiah 10 through 38, Nehemiah 13 verse 12, 
in the Old Testament, and in the New Testament we have Matthew 23, 23, and Luke 11, 42. Now, Leviticus 27, verse 30, And all the tithe of the land, whether of the seed of the land or of the fruit of the tree, is the Lord's. It is holy unto the Lord. Leviticus 27, 32, And concerning the tithe of the herd or of the flock, even of whatsoever passes under the rod, the tenth shall be holy unto the Lord. Numbers 18, verse 26. Thus speak unto the Levites, and say unto them, When you take of the children of Israel the tithes which I have given you from them for your inheritance, then you shall offer up an heave offering of it for the Lord, even a tenth part of the tithe. Numbers 18, 26 says that the priests are even supposed to tithe on the tithe. But do you see that happen in the modern church? I don't think so. Oh, sure, I'm sure there's that practice, and Steve Lumley actually was the first one who taught, told me this one, where the, the preacher actually takes the money, the check that he writes out, he, and he takes it out of one pocket, and then he puts it in his other pocket. You notice it's still in the pocket of the preacher. It hasn't gone into any storehouse. He puts it in his own pocket. Okay, but again, I digress. Deuteronomy 12, verse 17. You may not eat within the gates, your gates, the tithe of your corn or of your wine or of your oil, or the firstling of your herds or of your flock, nor any of your vows which you vow, nor your freewill offerings or heave offering of your hand. Here's the 10% that is supposed to go to the Lord that the priests are not supposed to touch. It says right there in Deuteronomy 12:17. Again, the money preachers fail to mention that. I will not fail to mention it. Okay, here we go again. Deuteronomy verse 14, 22. You shall truly tithe all the increase of your seed that the field brings forth year by year. Year by year. Not every week. Year by year. Deuteronomy 14, 23. And you shall eat before the Lord your God in the place which he shall choose to name his name there the tithe of your corn, of your wine, and of your oil, and the firstlings of your herds and of your flocks, that you may learn to fear the Lord your God always. I don't know about you folks, but I sure don't see any fear coming from the preachers, these wolves in the pulpit that would rob widows and orphans. No fear from them coming at all. In fact, you do notice how happy they are when you know, doing praise and worship there before they take the money from you, and all the preacher's all happy and clapping his hands, and I'm talking about you, George Morrison, at Faith Bible Chapel. I saw you do it repeatedly, how you're all happy and joyful and gay about clapping your hands, and oh, blessed be the Lord for this wonderful, wonderful day, when to you, dude, it was payday. No wonder you're happy and smiling. You knew you were getting paid, okay? But again, I digress. Okay? Deuteronomy 14, verse 28. At the end of three years, you shall bring forth all the tithe of your increase the same year and shall lay it up within your gates. Again, does that say anything about a weekly tithe check? Does that say anything about buying a piece of property and then having to tithe 10% of that prop price of that property to your church? No way, dude. It, it, it's just, it's not happening. Okay. Uh, and, and I'll continue to read these verses, but I'm sure that you can see by now that you've been played the fool. Okay, and if you continue to be played the fool, it's on your own head. Your blood is on your own head. It's not on my head. I've told you. I have warned you. Okay, but again, I continue. Second Chronicles 31 verse 5. And as soon as the commandment came abroad, the children of Israel brought in abundance of the first fruits of corn, wine, and oil and honey, and of all the increase of the field, and the tithe of all things brought they in abundantly. Okay, self-explanatory. Second Chronicles 31, verse 6. And concerning the children of Israel and Judah that dwelt in the cities of Judah, they also brought in the tithe of oxen and sheep, and the tithe of holy things which were consecrated unto the Lord their God, and laid them up by heaps. In other words, the, the, the tithes were plentiful. I mean, they were collecting them and, turn, and giving them every three years. And it was not 
10% of their stuff, it was tithing on the increase. Each year, they would grow more and more. Okay? I mean, just a simple review of the law. I mean, you know, reading Exodus, Numbers, De Deuteronomy, Leviticus, those four books of Moses that seem to be overlooked and, you know, you know, chastised by the modern church by saying, oh, it's the law, it's the law, I don't have any part of that, I'm a New Testament Christian. Well, there's no such thing as a New Testament Christian, but um, you know, they're all people of God, and God's God of the, he, the he writes the whole Bible. I mean, thanks to Bill Mancaro for that one. I'm sorry, Bill, I had to borrow that one. <laughs> but it's true. God wrote the whole Bible. But anyway, again, I digress. Um, Nehemiah, chapter 10, verse 38. And the priest, the son of Aaron, shall be with the Levites when the Levites take tithes. And the Levites shall bring up the tithe of the tithes unto the house of our God, to the chambers and in the treasure house. Nehemiah 13, verse 12. Then brought all Judah the tithe of the corn and the new wine and the oil unto the treasuries. As we now can see, the tithe was intended for the Levitical priesthood as their inheritance. Okay, again, it's their inheritance. The other tribes got portions of the land. The priests, being that the Lord was their portion, was entitled to receive the tithe. Okay. They were also to tithe on the tithes, Numbers 18 and 20 through 18, verse 26. The tithes were to be given out of the increase of the land every three years. This is the purpose of the tithe. Today's television evangelists, TBN, all the word faith movement, seed tithing, seed tithing all of it is unlawful. All of it. Now we're going to come to the fourth source. The wolves in the pulpit are always looking to isolate the Old Testament from the modern church, except in the instance where cut and paste theology can further deceive the congregations. Take, for instance, where they claim that Jesus commanded the church to tithe. And I put commanded in quotes. They com he commanded the church to tithe. Right. Here's a perfect example where context is discarded and the cut and paste theology can yet add a new dimension to the bait being used in the deception of the masses. Matthew chapter 23, verse 23. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin and have omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. These you should have done and not have left the other undone. Okay, the King James reads, these ought ye to have done and not to leave the other undone. And this is what I just showed you earlier in the sermon in Malachi, where the priests were obviously not conducting the sacrifices they were ordered to by God, as I just read to you again. Okay, this is not Jesus commanding the church to tithe. Nowhere close. I mean, it's just not there anymore. Jesus said, go and sell all that you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Okay, that's not saying tithe. Okay, and and, and there's a lot more to all of this, but, you know, I'm only, I'm only, you know, pointing out a few of these things here. The rest, you know, you should take the initiative and, and read your Bible. It's there for you to read, to study, to use as a, as a guidebook to life. Now, I might be not saying it the right way or the doctrinal way or the, the Presbyterian way or, or whatever. And it may not match up to, you know, the Westminster standards, how they put it. But it's basically, it's the same thing. Read your Bibles, people. Read your Bibles. Be Bereans. Study the scriptures. Forget about the concert. Forget about the baseball game. Okay? I mean, read your Bibles. I'm sure you don't want to have your money stolen from you. I mean, the government does enough of that already. But again, I continue to digress, and I apologize. Luke chapter 11, verse 42. But woe unto you, Pharisees, for you tithe mint and rue and all manner of herbs, and pass over judgment and the love of God. Again, these ought ye to have done, and not leave the other undone. Luke's saying the same thing Matthew did. Only Matthew wrote to Jews, and Luke wrote to Gentiles. Simple, but it's the same thing. Okay. When read in the context, which I will omit here for the sake of time, you can easily see that the reference to tithing here is not to tithe, but rather that even though they do this and that, they refuse to do the other. They conducted their business falsely and unfaithfully. And again, read Malachi for the historical context in the execution of the duties of the office of the priest, where, where God is angry with them and he's telling them what they're doing wrong. 
It's not like they don't know what they're doing wrong. God has told them already. Okay? Jesus here tells them this. Okay? It is not a commandment to modern-day congregations to hand over 10% of your earnings and property. Okay, now we move on to the fifth source. This is the final source, which I'm going to hit right now um, for the inspiration and bait that comes to us um, from these false preachers. Um, it comes from Acts chapter 4. And the scripture to lure in the congregation is thus. Acts 4.32 And the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and of one soul. Neither said any of them that ought of the things which he possessed was his own, but they had all things common. And with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. Neither was there any among them that lacked, for as many as were possessors of lands or houses sold them, and brought the prices of the things that were sold, and laid them down at the apostles' feet. Okay? This is the verse they use last to reel the members of the congregation in. They stop deliberately, I may add. They stop right there, okay, and look up. They look up, okay. Here they here and, and here they've committed a serious breach of trust in telling a half truth, okay. They didn't finish the script, the ver this, uh, the chapter for one to continue it, and I will read the entire verse in its context um, in a minute. But here they have committed a serious breach of trust in telling a half-truth. They ignore Jesus' command to go and sell all they have, and then they use this lie to put an exclamation point on their scheme. Okay, Being that the congregation, that is, those who read the text and follow along, have lifted their eyes to look at the minister of filth after he or she has stopped speaking, Okay, they're now fully pulled into the scheme. Okay? Because, and, the, and these preachers who do this know what they're doing. They know what they're doing. They know that whoever's following along is going to read and read and read until the priest stops, and then automatically they're going to look up at him to see what's coming next. They know that. Okay? <laughs> and they don't continue. Okay? And then the rest of them are just trying, busy trying to, to remember, you know, trying to keep up with the, with the pastor with what he's saying if they're not falling asleep or thinking about what's, you know, getting to the buffet table before, you know, before the assembly of God people do. I mean, really. <sighs> okay. The entirety of the context regarding the disposal of the possessions here in verse 35. Okay. Here is the complete verse to close the chapter. Uh, verses uh, 4, uh, uh, chapter 4, 35 through 37. Okay. And laid them down at the apostles' feet. And distribution was made unto every man according as he had need. And Joses, who by the apostles was surnamed Barnabas, which is being interpreted the son of consolation, a Levite and of the country of Cyprus, having land, sold it and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. Okay? And, and there's more to it that they use. They continue on in Acts chapter 5 and tell on the story of Anani uh, Ananias and Sapphira, how they lied to the Holy Ghost and Peter killed them for their lie because they only gave so much of what they had and the preachers like to use that to scare the living daylights out of their congregations and you better make sure you pay your 10% otherwise this is going to happen to you. You know, I mean, it just goes on and on and on. Okay, and anyway, I digress. Um, if the congregation had read the text in context, they would see that they have been duped into forking over 10% of their earnings and property falsely. And every now and then, the pastor... And I already mentioned his name once. Uh, in this case, I'm drawing my experiences from the non-denominational Faith Bible Chapel in Arvada, Colorado, pastored by George Morrison, who is also the sister church to Cornerstone in Texas, uh, John Haggy. And, and we'll say that only people who tithe can get financial help from the church. I actually got that when I was listening to Joe Moorcraft preach. He told a sermon about... Uh, how he had a fellow over in his basement for Thanksgiving and, you know, he was, you know, he cheated on his wife and all of that. And he was going to be excommunicated from the church and, you know, more craft is going on talking about, you know, well, you know, he doesn't pay his tithes. And, and then he goes on to say, you know, look, it, you're not going to get any help from this church if you don't pay your tithes. Okay. And this is a Presbyterian. This is a guy that's a theonomist. Um, I don't know how, I don't know really much about theonomy, but I'm sure that a lot of you listeners out there know who this guy is. I mean, he said it, okay? He said it. 
And I'm sure most of you know a pastor or have been in a church who have heard a pastor say that. You're not going to get any help from this church unless you pay your tithes. Shoot, you even got people that say you can't even join this church unless you pay your tithes. Okay, but again, well, let me continue on here so I can get this finished up. Um, I'm here to tell you that the scripture does not advocate or condone the practice of tithing to receive help, whether it be financially or physically. And there are other instances that are used and attributed to the Apostle Paul in the tithing scheme, uh, 2 Corinthians 9, to name one of them, um, when in truth this is what the Apostle has to say about money and reaping the war rewards of ministry and ministering to the flock. 1 Corinthians 9, verse 1, Am I not an apostle? Am I not free? Have I not seen Jesus Christ our Lord? Are you not my work in the Lord? If I am not an apostle unto others, yet doubtless I am to you, for the seal of my apostleship are you in the Lord. My answer to them that do examine me is this. Okay, he's, he's sitting there right out. He's sitting there letting the people know, examine me, charge me against the scriptures, make sure I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing. Don't sit there like idiots and just look at this guy and worse girl um, and just accept what they're saying as gospel. Paul is telling us right here that he's being examined. Examined. They are judging him according to the scriptures to make sure he's doing the he's preaching the gospel. And you people should be doing the same thing. Okay? I'm going to continue on here. Have we not power to eat and drink? Have we not power to lead about a sister, a wife, as well as other apostles, and as the brethren of the Lord, and Cephas? And Cephas is another name for Peter. Or I only and Barnabas. Have we not power to forbear working? Who goeth a warfare any time at his own charges? Who plants a vineyard and eats not of the fruit thereof? Or who feeds a flock and eats not of the milk of the flock? Okay. Say I these things as a man, or saith not the law the same also? For it is written in the law of Moses, You shall not muzzle the mouth of the ox that treads out the corn. Does God take care for oxen? Okay, and, and you know, continuing uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 10. Or saith he it altogether for our sakes? For our sakes, no doubt, this is written, that he that plows should plow in hope, and that he that threshes in hope should be partaker of his hope. If we have sown unto you spiritual things, is it a great thing if we reap your carnal things? If others be partakers of this power over you, are we not rather? Nevertheless, we have not used this power, but suffer all things for fear that we should hinder the gospel of Christ. I'm going to read that again, okay? And I want you to listen to me. Listen to me. I'm telling you. You need to look at these people in the churches that you attend, and you need to challenge them on this. Okay, even though the Apostle Paul here is saying that yes, you should the, the priest, you know, the preacher should be able to partake of his flock. Yes, he should be able to, especially if he's preaching the truth. You should want to support ministry. Not because you have to, but you should want to. And yes, he is entitled to it. But you don't give you don't support a guy who's not preaching the gospel. And this is where you have to use your common sense. Not just your common sense, but your biblical intuition. If this guy's not preaching the gospel, why are you giving him money? Okay, but again, let me continue here. I'm going to read again 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 12. And I want you to listen, okay? If others be partaker of this power over you, are we not rather? Nevertheless, we have not used this power, but allow all things, okay? Suffer all things, lest, or for fear that, we should hinder the gospel of Christ. Do you not know that they which minister about holy things live in the things of the temple, and they which wait at the altar are partakers with the altar? Even so has the Lord ordained that they which preach the gospel should live in the gospel. But I have used none of these things. Again, he says this, I have used none of these things, neither have I written these things, that it should be so done unto me, for it would be better for me to die than that any man should make my glorying void. For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of, for necessity is laid upon me. Yes, woe is unto me if I do not preach the gospel. Okay, he's not doing it for money. He's not doing it for any other reason than for the fear of his soul. <laughs> okay? 
1 Corinthians 9, verse 17. For if I do this willingly, I have a reward. But if it is against my will, a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me. Can we have that word dispensation? That's another sermon, but anyway. 1 Corinthians 9, 18. What is my reward then? Verily, or truly, that when I preach the gospel, I may make the gospel of Christ without charge, that I abuse not my power in the gospel. I'm going to read that again. Okay. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 18, in the context that Paul sets it in. Okay. That's all the verses that I've read before this. Okay, I'm not you were not to cut and paste this. You just read it. Okay, I'm reading it now singly for you, but this is the sum of everything that I just read to you. What is my reward then? Truly that when I preach the gospel, I may make the gospel of Christ without charge. For free, he's going to make it for free, that he abuses not his power in the gospel. He says people that charge abuse in saying what he says right there. And anybody who says otherwise is, is a moron. Okay? And believe me, I'm not politically correct. If you're a moron, I'm going to tell you you're a moron. Okay? And Paul right here is saying simply that he preaches the gospel for free so that he doesn't abuse his power in it. It's almost as if he knew somebody was going to do that. Oh, wait a minute. Somebody was doing that. Yeah, the Pharisees were doing it. Okay. Verse 19. For though I be free from all men, yet have I made myself servant unto all that I might gain the more. Okay, and then he goes on from verse 20 to verse 27, the rest of what he's talking to the people in Corinth. Now, to finish up here, Paul states in verses 1 through 19 how he perceives the whole money thing. In verse 14 through 19, he claims that taking the rewards of ministry can be abused and make the preaching of the gospel message null and void. Now, we'll read this again. Listen carefully. 1 Corinthians 9, 14 through 19. I'm not, I'm not going to read it again. You can reread it yourselves, but you know it's important to read this. Okay, Paul knew the danger of living off the preaching of the gospel. He knew that it could corrupt him. He chose not to live off the preaching of the gospel. Simple. So, Joel Osteen, Ken Copeland, Pat Robertson, John Hagee, Paula White, Creflo Dollar, TB Inners, etc. This sermon is directed toward you. In closing, my prayer is that those who are under the bondage of the prosperity gospel and are not there willingly to abuse the Lord or get financial gain be powerfully removed from out of this hedonistic and whorish church. That's my prayer. That is what I would pray for you. And I hope that all of you pray for each other in that matter. That those who are stuck in, in this poisonous church, this, this den of vipers, called the prosperity preachers and the word of faith movement and all of that. Pray for your friends to get out of that. Help them to get out of that. Share this sermon. for I mean, for it's free for crying out loud. Share it. Use it. Use it. It's free to me, free to you. Use it. You have the material now. Okay? There are those who go there, that is, those who go to church and have mammon in their hearts and their minds. Okay, there are people who actually come to church for this reason, okay, and you have to realize that too. Those people you're not going to convince, okay, and there's no point in beating yourself up over it. It's just that simple. You're not going to convince them. They're there to get rich. They're there to be prospered. They want their best life now. <laughs> um, God forbid that this madness of the prosperity gospel be allowed to continue. May the Lord strike down those who seek to pervert the gospel of truth for their own financial gain. May the Lord draw out these false churches, those to whom he has called according to his purpose. I thank you for your time in reading or listening to this message. May the Lord bless and preserve you all. For Jesus' sake, amen.